In an effort to stay on time, uh, we'll get started. Good morning again to those of you that might be viewing from home. We're going to begin our worship hour. We have Joe George speaking today. And to begin with our worship, let's begin with uh, our first song, A New Creature. Buried with Christ, my blessed Redeemer, dead to the old life of holy and sin, Satan's in Yeah. 
In our news, uh, news and notes, we always have uh, a prayer list, of course, and there's always those that we have that sometimes don't get written in here. In the last week or so, of course, we've had uh, the death of one of our grandmothers and mothers, Pat Bloodworth's mother passed away, Sister Thomas, Geneva's grandmother, of course. We want to remember that family. Also, in the last couple of weeks, the Wells family, which is part of the Barksdale's family, they lost a uh, young man, Tom. We have these things in life, and we live them through them. Our prayer list, of course, is here to remind us of those who have need. We all have need. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you praising your name and thanking you for the blessings you give to us, and especially your son who gave us life, gave us forgiveness, that we have eternal life in you. Be with us this day, Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, that we worship you together, that these things, Heavenly Father, we pray they're acceptable in your sight and your hearing. And Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly. Be with our prayer list, Heavenly Father. We have many who have needs for heal. And that healing, Heavenly Father, is both physical and spiritual and mental. We ask you to be with us because we know that you are the healing hand that guides us. We pray that you be with those physicians and nurses who take care of these. And Heavenly Father, that they guide them in the right direction in your healing will. Be with us this day, Heavenly Father, as we listen to the word. And we pray for Brother George as he brings us that word. We thank you for the teachers that are here this day that have tried to teach our children and Heavenly Father to listen to your word as adults. We pray for those who are watching on our video, that they're out there, that they see the words and the work that we are doing here. And to remind us of the things that we can actually physically do here, that we gather together to pray, to sing, to worship you. And the works that we do, Heavenly Father, in the shelter, in the food pantry, in the classes, and the visitations, Heavenly Father, that they continue on. Because those things, Heavenly Father, need to be done hand to hand and ear to ear. Be with us this day. We thank you for all the blessing you continuously give to us. Heavenly Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is a
Does anyone need a communion set? Begin. <clears throat> if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to start in Leviticus chapter 4 this morning. If we prepare our thoughts before we offer communion. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done, and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins and brings guilt on any of the people, let him offer to the Lord for his sin which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish, as a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the bull's head. He shall kill the bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of the sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting, and he shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar and the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall take it from it all of the fat of the bull as a sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat which is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove. And as it was taken from the bull of the sacrifice of the peace offering, the priest shall burn them on the altar before the Lord. But the bull's hide and all of its flesh with its head, its legs, its entrails and its offal, the whole bull he shall carry outside of the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire and the ashes are poured out shall not be burned. This is the instructions for unintentional sin. It's interesting here, this is an unintentional sin committed by one of the priests. The specifics of what they were to do to make an atonement for the sin that they had committed. question this morning that I want to start with, what did the bull do wrong? The bull did absolutely nothing wrong, but it was the one that had to make the sacrifice for the person's sin. And this is not just any bull that was to be taken. Remember, this was to be the best that this person had. This would be the one that my grandfather owned a farm, 80 acres of farm in southern Missouri, raised uh, bulls for a while. He had pigs, he had other things, but this would be the bull that he would call his friends over to talk about and show off. And then he would have to take it to the door of the tabernacle, place his hand upon the head of the bull, Confess his transgressions and slaughter the bull because of his mistake. And how many hundreds of thousands of times was this done under the Levitical priesthood? And it wasn't just to kill the bull. They were very specific about what all was to be done with every part of it and how it was to be disposed of, how it was to be carried out. The ritual was done over and over and over again. How many hundreds of thousands of innocent bulls were sacrificed? In Hebrews chapter 9, the Hebrew writer would tell us, But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, not with his own blood. He entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling of the unclean, sanctifies for the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The same scenario happens in the sacrifice of Jesus. The one who was without sin, the one who was the best that God had to offer, paid the price for our transgressions. He was the one who suffered for us. Probably way more than the bulls under the Old Testament. If you remember, they were to slice the throat. Their death came relatively quickly. They didn't feel the pain and the torture that Jesus would have felt as his death came over a period of many hours. But because he was viewed as the perfect sacrifice, we can have our conscience clean before the living God. To keep in mind that we are assembled here this morning to remember that body that was sacrificed for us, the blood that was shed for us, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness finally. James would write in James chapter 5 <clears throat> that we are to confess our faults one to another, pray for one another, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're here this morning to always remember the sins that we have committed and that this body and the blood that Jesus gave for us can cleanse us from those sins. Let's offer thanks for the bread this morning. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are thankful that you have sent your Son to this earth, that we no longer depend upon the blood of bulls and goats for the sanctification of sin, but that your Son came as the perfect sacrifice for us, that he willingly offered himself on the cross outside the walls of Jerusalem, that he gave his body as the sacrifice, that we may be reconciled to you, that we may stand before you justified, that we can call upon you and through an avenue of prayer and that you hear us. We're thankful for this time that we have to remember the body. We're thankful for this bread that represents his body. And we ask that you would bless it to our spiritual nourishment. Your son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's continue our things. Our God and Father in heaven, we are mindful at this time of the blood that your son shed for us that 2,000 years later that blood still provides forgiveness of sins if we are faithful to you and if we confess our faults as we have been instructed to do that you will provide forgiveness through your son's blood as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents his blood again we ask that you would bless it to our spiritual nourishment it's in your son Jesus name I pray amen as Paul would write to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 we have shown forth the Lord's death and if he chooses we will assemble again next Sunday to remember again. We always take this opportunity to be mindful of the blessings that we have been given on this earth. There's a box on the table in the back for you to make a contribution to. Remember that God has only asked us to do cheerfully and as we have been prospered. Would you pray with me? Our God and our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we truly live in a nation that is so blessed. And it's so easy for us to get 
caught up in the cares and concerns of this world. It's so easy for us to look at others and see what we don't have instead of being mindful of what you have truly blessed us with. You have blessed us more than we truly deserve and anything than we can ever repay. We ask as we return a small portion to you this morning that we would do so cheerfully and that it would be used to further your work throughout the world, throughout this community. And may we always be mindful of how blessed and fortunate we are. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Before Brother George brings us a lesson, we'll sing There's a Royal Banner. There's a royal banner given for display to soldiers of the verses 16 to 20. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked with him when he saw that the city was given over to the idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And he took them, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is for which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Good morning to everyone. We are going to um, take into consideration God's Word at this time. The last verse that was read in our hearing from Acts 17 was verse 20. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. What these things mean. Aside from passages such as Acts 20 and verse 7 that tells us upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. We gather a couple of things that the primary purpose for our first day of the week assembly is to memorialize the sacrifice that God has made for us in the breaking of bread. The bread that we break, is it not 
the communion of the body of Christ. The cup which we drink, is it, is it not a memorial to the blood of that new covenant? So we have an understanding of the meaning of those things. But Paul used that occasion to exhort, to encourage the saints of God to compel them to remember that we're called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. And we're going to get a reminder of that this morning. I've got notes that I haven't fully synthesized for this occasion. So I may struggle just a bit to try to bring all of this together. But I want to, I want to challenge everyone this morning to remember that for some to be Christian costs them little. But for those of us who know that we have been brought out of the world into this marvelous relationship with God through Christ, that first and foremost, we are disciples, meaning that we are students. We are learners. We are pupils of the greatest teacher of all, which is Christ. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. And we know how great wisdom is, right? From Solomon asking for wisdom in order to discern or to judge between God's people so that he could be a proficient, efficient king and to do right rather than wrong. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Give me knowledge and the ability to apply this thing rightly so that I can decide when matters are brought before me that are too great. And I can decide right is the implication. That's before every one of us every day of our lives. Choices. From which pair of pants we put on in the morning or whether we get up on time or hit the snooze. And the effect, the consequences of those decisions that we make and how they affect us through the course of every day. But we've got a multitude of decisions and choices from the youngest to the eldest of us, we have decisions to make. So yes, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. Know how to use what has been presented to us. Now, I don't know how many of you would remember a message that I preached some time ago, but I asked the question, if you were asked what one verse of scripture could you offer that summarized the whole of the scriptures, and, and I gave you mine, the one that I gave you was Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 31. I'm repeating this because there are things that we ought to remember and never forget. Proverbs 15 verse 31 says, The ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. Now that's the King James Version. I'm not quite sure how other Bible versions would render that, 
But nevertheless, the meaning of that is so impactful. It, 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 it grabbed my attention when I prayerfully asked God, what is the significance and the relevance of what I just read? How does it resonate? How is it to resonate with my life? What does it call me to do? And in the Hebrew Shema is translated the ear that hears. Shema is a Jewish practice. Orthodox Jews will recite Shema three to five times a day. Shema comes from Deuteronomy chapter six, reading from verse number four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now generally, folk would stop there. But Moses continued. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Where should the word be? Where should the commandment be? In our hearts. We should remember, we should retain, we should have certain biblical principles as a guiding light to us every day. When I was working as chaplain in the prison system, whenever I met a new prisoner, it wouldn't be long before he received a challenge from me to memorize Psalm chapter 1. To memorize it and then to draw from it all the substance and the nourishment that would guide him the rest of his days. The words have meaning and there is a reason it is contained in scripture. And we ought not forget that God intends to bless us if we listen, hear, believe, trust, and obey. We've got to know what to do. We've got to know what God requires of us. The Orthodox Jews wear a phylactery. And in the phylactery are the words of Shema. They will stand at the wailing wall and they will recite Shema. If you ask, which we can read in scripture, if we had time to look at the numerous passages and the references to Shema. Rabbi, they said to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Or what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the greatest rabbi of all would say, would ask in, re in return, what is written in the law? What do you understand it to say? And the man would answer back with Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But we need to also take Shema to its proper end. Again, just reflecting on a prison service that I was in, and I was asked to be the keynote speaker, and I made reference to Shema, and what I said offended at least one person in attendance. And they created this great big kerfuffle that had to be ironed out afterwards because I said 
it is better to do Shema than to say it. It is better to actively engage in the practice of loving God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength than merely say it and not demonstrate it. Many of our, of our women folk can attest to the fact that it's a good thing to hear expressions of love, but you know what they want more than the words? I mean, the words are fine and good if there's an action that supports it. They don't want the words without the action. They want the action to precede the words so that there is something to relate it to. So how can we say that we love God whom we have not seen and despise our brother that we see every day? So the second commandment, which is like the first, the second being of the greatest, or to the greatest, is to love your neighbor as yourself. He that loves his neighbor as himself hath fulfilled all the law, the scriptures say. So there's an action that is preferred, an action that is intended so that we go beyond words to actually doing. As Jesus would say, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And so there has to be understanding of what the words mean and how or what it requires of us in obedience so that we can so properly subordinate ourselves and demonstrate our respect and our reverence for God for walking out our faith and not just talking about it. James said, you show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. And sometimes, you know, we get this thing where we want to talk about uh, righteousness and, and, and holiness from a work perspective. Let me make it very clear that we do not work to be saved. We work because of what God has done to save us and our effort and actions are a demonstration of our gratitude for God who has done what none of us could do by ourselves nor all of us together. Think about the scripture that was read and preference to communion and how many bulls went to slaughter for the sins of mankind. Knowing that the scriptures now that we've got the New Testament, it tells us it's not possible that the blood, the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Sometimes we have the audacity to elevate one person above another. And we talk about, uh, in fact, I was listening to a young man preach in Kansas City, and he was talking about uh, King James of England, and talking about what, what, what a uh, twisted person he was. And I, and I thought he was doing that to cast some shade on the King James translation. And so I took it upon myself to ask the young man, what, what was your point in doing that? And I don't recall what his remarks were, but this is one thing I wanted to put up on his head. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. So if you think pointing to King James of England, who, by the way, did not translate the scriptures, but he authorized it, and there were 70 other biblical scholars that did the work, 
But if you think you're going to cast shade and, and cast doubt on the scripture because of one man's fault and as though you are better than him, you got another thing coming. Because all souls belong to God. And there are none righteous, no, not one. We need to realize that what God is able to do through a donkey, that's by his own divine providence. And God can use whomsoever he wills. Don't question God. Ask yourself, are you in concert with, with his will? Are you doing what he requires? Because ultimately, that's what all scripture is leading us to do. So with that, I want to share this. At my workplace, there is a mural of Martin Luther King Jr. And beneath the image is a quote, a quotation that reads, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk his position, his prestige, and even his life for the welfare of others." Unquote. As I was driving here this morning, I stopped at a red light. And sitting at the corner was a man with a sign asking for help. And I thought, I could just drive right on by and justify going on to church and putting every little coin that I've got into the box and ignore that guy sitting there with the sign. And you know how the thoughts come to us so quick and we realize that, I, you know, this first day of the week, I gotta lay in store and, and, and put that in the box. But there's the guy with the sign. And I thought of the story of the Good Samaritan. And I thought of the priest that could probably justify stepping over the guy and just going on about his business. I thought of the Levite who did the same thing. But then I thought of the Samaritan who stopped and rendered aid. And so I rode down my window. And I helped the guy. And I'm no better than anybody else. I haven't always done that. And I certainly don't have enough resources to help everybody with a sign. Because where I work, many of them have signs. I work with the homeless. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience. When everything is going well, when everything is good, we can be grateful to God that we're blessed, right? But what about the times when adversity sets upon us? Or we encounter loss, personal or in our associations and in our relationships. 
Can we be thankful even when there is some catastrophe, an adverse situation beyond our control that sets upon us? How thankful are we to God then? On Saturday, yesterday, I thought to pick up one of my um, devotional guides and read it to see what the day's meditative thought was so that I could go and share it with the community that I serve as, as chaplain. And what I read served as coals on my own head to remember a time in my life that was not, not like any other. What I read, there's a, there's a scripture that says, when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Uh, scripture reference, 1 Peter 2, verse 20. But this is the thought that was associated with that. A 17th century theologian Is quoted, don't be so upset when evil men and women defraud you. Let them do as they please, just seek to do the will of God. Silent peace and sweet fellowship with God will repay you for every evil thing done against you. Fix your eyes on God. And then this was added. God allows painful situations to come into your life. And according to the theologian, he does this for your benefit. It's followed by a question for our benefit. God allows us to suffer things for our benefit. Let me share with you something that I very seldom talk about. 1985, Kansas City Royals were in the World Series. They were playing for that top honor to be the, the champion that year. I was seated in my living room in my home in Kansas City. Now, for those of you that don't know, uh, I've been here in Leavenworth since January 1988. But in 1985, I was watching the Royals play fabulous baseball in the World Series. And there's a knock at the door. And I get up, thinking it's family, and I open the door. But my eyes are still on the TV. I don't want to miss a play. And I think there's family standing at the door. And it was a deputy sheriff that came with court order to remove me from my home. I wasn't planning a trip to go anywhere, didn't have any money, had made no plans, and cell phones were not as plentiful as they are now. I couldn't call anyone. 
he allowed me to throw all of my worldly possessions in two trash bags, which consisted of my clothes and my Bible. Didn't have any luggage, didn't have any money, and he escorted me from my home. I was working. I was attending church. I was a member of the Roswell Church of Christ in Kansas City, Kansas. But on this particular day, I'm being escorted from my home by a deputy sheriff who tells me, Mr. George, this is one of the hardest parts of my job. And he asked, where would you like for me to take you? And I said, dude, that's my house. What do you mean, where do I want you to take me? By order of the court, there's also a restraining order. You can't come back here. You need to leave. I got to take you somewhere. Where would you like for me to take you? I had him drive me across town to a sisters that I hadn't talked to in many months. Didn't know whether she was home. But he dropped me off there. I left my trash, the trash bags with my clothes on the front porch. And I went walking, trying to wrap my head around what just happened to me. But I'm walking and talking with God. This is what I was reminded of as I read this devotion to share with the community yesterday. And I shared some similar remarks with them with which they could relate perhaps more so because I'm talking to a predominantly homeless community. But I'm sharing with many of them who were hearing for the first time that yes, Chaplain Joe knows what it's like to be homeless. But on, on that occasion where I'm walking and talking with God, I'm asking some of the same questions that many of you might ask if tragedy struck without any warning, no advance notice. Why me? Why now? Why? When I'm trying to be a better husband, a better father, a better worker, a better a member of the body of Christ, a better this and a better that, I'm trying, and then this happens. You know, what was demonstrated to me that day was that things that I had valued in life could be taken from me so easily by someone whom I never met. I don't know the name, never knew the name of the judge. I mean, I, I'm sure I could have known, but I didn't know the name of the judge that signed that order. He never met me. And I thought that had he given a moment to discuss anything with me, perhaps we could have found a different way of dealing with whatever the issues and the concerns were. But it didn't happen that way. But as I was walking and praying to God, realizing that everything of value the perception that I had showed how transitory and how temporal possession can be. But the one thing no one could take from me is my faith in God. And I had a choice. I could choose to walk with God and to continue walking by faith even though I didn't know where I was going to lay my head or otherwise provide for myself. I did not know. In fact, I'll tell you on the, on the other side, as I'm walking and talking with God, 
I, I have no idea how long I was gone, but uh, my sister would get home before I returned, and she had her boys set those trash bags out at the curb. <laughs> and she didn't know what they were. Thank God I did return before the trash truck got there. <laughs> but my sister had five boys. And she was struggling as a single mom to make it on her own. And in as much as I had been surprised, now she's surprised that one of her adult brothers has just shown up. And he's got nowhere to go. She didn't have room for me. She didn't have food prepared for me. She didn't have utilities in such a proportion that she could just freely give me and help me. And I felt so awkward but appreciative still for the little storage area where she had boxes and things stored, that there was just a little floor space that I could make a bed until I could figure out my next step. But my prayer to God before I returned to my sister's address was this. Lord, I don't understand what's going on and why this happened now. I don't know what the end of all of this is going to be. But the one thing that has already been demonstrated in my life So I can't trust possessions, but I can trust you. People can take everything else, but they can't take my faith. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to stay and remain on this path. I know that you called me out of darkness into the light. I know that you have translated me into the kingdom of your dear son. I don't know how this is going to be resolved, but I'm going to be faithful unto death. And God allowed me to experience things in a way I never dreamed. I never saw myself becoming a chaplain, a prison evangelist, uh, director of Church of Christ prison ministry, none of that. But I did envision that I could be faithful to God no matter what. But as I began, I want to emphasize God requires us to do his will. It's up to us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, to become workmen that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, in the midst of my homeless experience, the woman who had been the only mother figure really in my life was my paternal grandmother. She passed away when I was homeless. My father, who had reared me, was in a VA hospital down in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he was on his deathbed. I just lost my home, my family, as I perceived it at that time. And All that was gone. I had to, I was reduced to nothing to learn to appreciate and to value 
this privilege and opportunity to walk with God, to live by faith over and above everything. I'm continuing that journey this very day. We can all do that. And God expects us to. The, and I, I, I know my time is not going to allow me to go. I've got so much that I want to share. Uh, time is not our friend in these instances. But beneath that mural picture of um, Martin Luther King Jr. is that quote that I gave you where he says that where, where a man stands at times of challenge and controversy and what the true neighbor will, will do, he will risk his position, his prestige, and even his life for the welfare of others. That put me in mind of the question that was asked to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus would tell the story that we know so well as the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. A certain man became the victim of thieves. They wounded, robbed the man, left him for dead. The injured man was seen by the priest, the Levite, neither of which bothered to help the wounded man. The Samaritan, on the other hand, saw the man had compassion on him. And the description of how the Samaritan helped the wounded man sounds well, the description gives us an indication, I should say, of what would be required of disciples of Christ. The question Jesus asked was this, which of the three do you think was neighbor unto the man that fell among the thieves? And the man that had asked responded, he that showed mercy on him, to which Jesus would respond, go and do thou likewise. This was in response to Shema. Here is a poem of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, this entitled Psalm of Life. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow in, is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead pass, bury its dead. Act. Act in the living present. Heart within and God overhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us 
footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seen shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. The scripture that was read for us before I came up to the podium was from Acts chapter 17. And Paul waiting in Athens, his spirit stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So many others had seen the same thing. But how many were moved to action? Paul saw the city wholly given to idolatry and he thought if nobody else is going to do anything, nobody else is going to say anything, I cannot sit still and not tell people. And so they wanted to know, well, what, what's this babbler going to say? You seem to be a setter forth of strange gods because he's talking about a resurrection from the dead. And Paul began to exclaim there at Areopagus, uh, which better known as Mars Hill. Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you, God that made the worlds and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all life and breath hath made of one blood all nations to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation that they might seek after God if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being even as some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring, for as much then as we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto stone or wood graven by art and man's device. The times of this ignorance God hath overlooked, he hath winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, and that he, God, hath raised him, Jesus, from the dead. And here's where I'm going with this. In Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse number 1, the question is asked, what, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It's the new life that God has called us into. Inasmuch as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ... He's a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I became homeless because that was a consequence of the way I used to live, the way I used to be. And unfortunate, it's unfortunate that those things caught up with me after I return to the Lord, return to the fellowship of the saints, it could not undo the chain of reactions that would eventually catch up 
with me. It was nobody's fault but mine. I can't blame no one else for what I did. The scripture tells us, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. We come here to break bread, but we also come to be exhorted, to be mindful of the truth of God that calls us to action, to demonstrate our appreciation for what God has done for us. And yes, that precious Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, died for us, but he was raised for our justification. If you're here today and you're not a member of the body of Christ, you need to be one. God loved you so much that he paved the way for you to come and to come today, to come now. But come in repentance. Come with true contrition, remorse, regret, and godly sorrow for any and all the wrongs that you've done. When God receives you, he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And when you are immersed to be raised from a watery grave, to walk in newness of life, renew your hearts and your minds with God's word. To be success successful in life, you must replace negatives with a positive. You turn from sin and error, transgression and ungodliness to what God says is right. But it is in the doing of his will that affirms your true gratitude and appreciation for what only God could do. And God is our Savior. He is our Savior and our Lord. Let's stand together as we stand and sing the selected song of encouragement. Listening to, to Joe preach, uh, I had an idea and uh, I looked up a scripture and this is the scripture I'm, uh, that I want to read to you real quick. It is uh, the last half of Psalms 4113. Amen and amen. Thank you, Brother George, for the wonderful lesson. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day that we can call upon you as the first day of the week. Father, we remember that, as Joe said, we all have hearts that need repentance. And there's times you tap us on the shoulder and remind us that we are living to be with you one day. 
Father, we, may we all emulate Christ. May we know Christ better. We may learn of him and be example to others that they might follow towards him. That although we might know scriptures forwards and backwards, to know you is to know him is what we should exemplify as we carry on in this world. We ask you to be with those that are sick and suffering, those that are traveling. Help us all grow spiritually stronger in you. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you.